Now, come with me today, and I'm going to do two things here, so I want you to be attentive, all right? We've got two things that we're going to uh, work on here in this, in this teaching, in this preaching session, and I want you to receive what it is the Lord's saying. Uh, and that is that, first of all, we had, uh, as I said, and I don't want to overemphasize, but we had a, a very good prayer training yesterday. It was a very good time. And uh, some great things were said, and I think some more importantly, that God confirmed his word with signs and wonders. How many of you know that's in the Bible? In the book of Acts, it says that God confirmed his word with signs and wonders. And there was uh, evidence yesterday at the end of the teaching that God was pleased with what was said. And um, in that in fact, prayer uh, is many things to each of us. I'm not going to really preach about prayer, but I, I want you to hear this piece because it relates. Uh, prayer can be and is many things to each of us. Each of us uh, has a perspective on prayer. Uh, it's one thing that all of us have done and all of us can do. Even the atheist prays, though they pray to an unknown God, or they pray to themselves. How many of you hear that? Even an atheist prays when he's in trouble and he prays to himself, help me, soul. <laughs> and, 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 but everybody prays. And there's no atheist in the foxholes. When the guns are flaring, bullets are flying, even the staunchest liberals and others that would have nothing to do with God in a public setting. Let me tell you, those French folks the other day, they were praying like you can't believe. It's amazing how prayer can... You get an airplane and you hit turbulence. We dropped 1,000 feet one time. I've been in a plane crash. And the plane, when the plane flips on its side and starts shaking and starts dropping at 1,000 feet. And things are flying out of the overhead. And everything's coming up. <laughs> gross when you get down settled and you find throw up on the ceiling that's a real rough rough flight and here it is when it's going on man you should hear it by Jesus help me I won't do it again I'm sorry Lord people are confessing things I mean if I had a recorder I could make some money afterwards this is what you said you know uh, should I play that for your wife <laughs> How many of you know confession is good for the soul? So prayer is something that we all connect to in some way. Now, but uh, one thing that prayer is, and that it's the stewardship of spiritual, our spiritual life in Christ. Prayer is the stewardship of your life in Christ. Prayer is the stewardship. Now, the word stewardship there is simply means management or manage of. It does not mean ownership. When you are a steward of something, you only manage something. You don't own it. How many of you hear this? Come on, are you with me today? So stewards manage something. They don't own something. So when you take that word and connect it to prayer, prayer it's the stewardship of our spiritual life. We don't own this spiritual life. We are just managers of it on the earth. Come on, how do you hear me? And, and what you do as God's manager of his property is important. How many of you know he owns you? If you're a Christian, he bought you. You've been paid for. You've been bought by the blood of the Lamb. And because he bought you, he owns you, he has rights to you. You're not your own. And because of that, then you're not your own. He's the steward of, you're the steward of what he owns. I mean, you know, the earth is the Lord's. And the fullness thereof and all that dwell therein. All right? The earth belongs to the Lord. We don't own the earth. Some of you say, well, I own my property. Well, on a document you do, but in reality, the same God that owns it can stick your rotten body in it. Think about that. 
You think you got something? The God that owns the land you say you think you own will one day put your rotting body in the same dirt. That means he's got to be in charge. How many of you hear that? Now, 1 Peter chapter 4. Let's go there. I'm going to read a little bit to you. <laughs> and I'll help you. I think I can help us all understand some. This is an important word for this church for 2000. And uh, 15. And uh, we'll see what the Lord says. Is maybe we'll even continue some on it next week. But uh, let's just see. First Peter chapter 4. And I'm going to read a little bit of it from the New Living Testament. Okay? Uh, you can put it up there in King James. That's fine. But I'm going to read it unless you have it in the New Living. Yeah. Oh, you have it? Okay. Maybe they can stick it up there. Uh, and in verse 7 it says... The end of the world is coming soon. How many of you hear that? That's pretty, that's pretty drastic. Now, this is written back in his day, in Peter's day. If the world was coming to an end back then, where in the world are we now? How many hear that? The end of the world is coming soon. That's important. Now, therefore, because of the situation of the world because of the circumstances in the world it's important to read it that way be earnest and disciplined in your prayers I have you say lord because it's the end of the world i need to be more earnest committed dedicated and more uh uh disciplined where i have an assigned understanding that i need to be more disciplined about my prayer life how many of you hear that and I just want to invite you now to understand something. Those of you that sign that piece of paper and sign up to come into the house of God for prayer and you get here one hour a week, I guarantee you before God, if you do this for five weeks in a row, you're going to say to those around you, something has started to change. But if you go there a couple times and then you go back again a couple times and then you go back five weeks later and you go back another time or two and you just keep speaking you know, sporadic. You can't build a, a consistent thing with that. How many of you hear me? And, and how many of you know you don't go to your job that way? You don't eat that way? Hello? We need to be consistent people. So it says here, therefore be earnest because of the fact the world's coming to an end. Uh, the end of the world is coming soon. Therefore be earnest and disciplined in your prayers. Verse 8, most important of all, continue to show deep love for each other, for uh, lovers, uh, for lovers, uh, for love overcomes a multitude of sin. For love overcomes a, or covers a multitude of sin. How many of you see that? Love covers a multitude of sin. Now, still keep it in context. Verse 9, cheerfully share your home with those who need a meal or plan to stay. Now look at this verse 8 and verse 9. Most important of all, that's pretty drastic, continue to show deep love for each other. I mean, Peter is laying down some biblical principle here that we should be earnest in our prayers. We should be uh, continually in deep love. That's not shallow kind of love. And uh, because remembering that love covers a multitude of sins, so we're going to be merciful in our love. Verse 9, cheerfully, we're going to be happy to share our home with those who need a meal or a place to stay. I mean, that's pretty, uh, that's pretty radical Christianity. And then verse 10, God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. I want to anchor there a second. How many of you know God has given each of you and I a gift from his great variety package of spiritual gifts? Every one of you has a gift. Every one of you has gifts. And may I admonish you, you should not use your gift for the world and never use it for God. May that gift dry up. If you only ever use your gift for the world and never for the kingdom of God, I pray that your gift dries up because that's not what God intended. God intended to give you gifts, which he did, but he intended you to use your gift for the kingdom and for yourself. 
How many of you know that Ashley playing the piano, I'm glad she don't sit at home and play. I'm glad she shares that gift, aren't you? And, and, and that's the point we need to understand. So he says, God has given each of you a gift from, uh, uh, up from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well, but, but you use those gifts to serve one another. Now he's brought in another aspect. He's brought in the prayer. He's brought in the fact of opening our homes uh, to people and being generous and hospitality and all that. Uh, he's talking about loving one another. He's talking about using our gifts to bless others and, uh, and to serve one another. He says, verse 11, do you have the gift of speaking? He gives an example. Then speak as though God himself were speaking through you. Some of you have a gift of speaking, but you just use it for the devil. How do you know if you have a gift of speaking, you should use it for the kingdom, not for complaining murmuring, backbiting, bitterness. You shouldn't use that gift for things that tear up. You should use it for things that build up. <laughs> Do you have the gift of helping others? Some of you have that gift, but you help yourself before you help others. It says, do it with all the strength and energy that God supplies then everything you do will bring glory to God through Jesus Christ, all glory and power to him forever and ever. Amen. I mean, that's a great scripture there. Each of us has received a gift of spiritual endowments and spiritual impartation from God to be used to serve him and to serve others. And I want to talk to you about that. Ephesians chapter 6. And uh, verse 5, and I'm reading out of the King James on this one. Now, God has commanded you to serve earthly, your earthly masters uh, as service unto him. Now, we're going to pick at this a little bit, so you need to come with me now. How many of you are glad you're in church? Come on, how many of you are glad you're alive? All right, now, Ephesians chapter 6, servants be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in singleness of your heart, as unto Christ. How do you see that? Go to verse 6. Not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. With good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men. With good, being good and doing it as unto the Lord, not, not to men. Knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. So Paul says here in the book of Ephesians that we have a responsibility to put our servanthood on display. And we have an opportunity every day. And that we should serve the masters of our life whether it be our boss, whether it be whoever, that's who is the master of your circumstance in your life. And you should be a servant there and it should be evidence that you're serving God when you serve that person. Have you here? How many of you know we can change the environments around us if we serve those that are over us? Hello? We can change the environment around us if we serve those over us. And if you really want to find how the Bible says, uh, Jesus told us to be great in the kingdom is to be servant of all. You want to be great in the kingdom, learn to serve. So at your job and the place that you're at and, and uh, kids with parents and, and uh, in the house of God and all the aspects, every time there's somebody that's over us, we need to say, Lord, I'm going to serve that person as I'm serving, as if I was serving you. And each of us must discover the path of life, not choose it for ourselves. This whole process of learning to be servants and learning to serve others and learning to uh, be a steward of our prayer life and to be a steward of our spiritual life is real important here, saints. Each of us must discover the path of life, not choose it for ourselves. Most of the time, 
what we end up doing in life is we choose something that we want to do and we choose that and then we ask God to come over and bless that. How many of you know, saints, you got to learn that to be a, a really solid citizen of the kingdom, you're going to learn something, you're going to have to learn something that you have to say, I want his will, not mine. Now, let me, let me fill something in. His will is important here. God's will is important. We make a mistake and we think that God's will is associated often with a thing or an event or a job description. When I came into the kingdom of God, I was in uh, construction. I was working around building houses and I was also running heavy equipment, cranes, bulldozers, all that kind of stuff, big, heavy, giant equipment. <clears throat> and I was part of a union and all these kind of things. And also I was doing a lot of house building and, and that kind of thing. And um, in that process, when I came into the kingdom, you see, if I had associated the will of God with my occupation, then I would have been frustratedly trying to change my occupation. What I needed to realize was I came in as a carpenter or as a builder. I needed to find God's will in that place. How many of you here? And what happens with Christians is they get all screwed up in their head and they start uh, buying into bad doctrines and they think that the will of God must be that I move into some new arena of work. Now, mine did lead that way eventually. The will of God is an unfolding revelation. So it did take me to a place where I laid down my tools and I picked up the word of God and began to change over. So God changed those things. He will do that. But I'm saying in the initial point, when you come into the kingdom of God, uh, his will is about doing everything that satisfies him wherever you're at. Have you here? Some people say, well, I'll do the will of God once I change this position. I'll do the will of God once I become this or that. No, you do the will of God right where you're at. If you come in as an undertaker or if you come in as a plumber, if you come in as a scientist, I don't care how you come in, you find the will of God in that, then the unfolding revelation of the will of God can become what you need it or want it to be. But if you're not faithful to the will of God in the small things that God gives, he will never let you have the big things. I watch people, you know, that, that live under the banner of their, their minds that go under attack all the time. And they, they're, they're constantly acting like schizophrenics. They're Christians and today they're loving Jesus. I mean, today they are so in love with Jesus. And tomorrow their schizophrenic has moved in. And now you don't even know if they're coming to church anymore. Hello? And, and, and yesterday they, they, were, they were singing or, or they were serving. They were ushering. They were, oh, hallelujah. Oh. The next day. Where's brother so-and-so? They come to church still? What happened? We find ourselves constantly in a combative place of forcing our will into what should be surrender to his will. And the battle goes on every day. The battle between spirit and flesh. The battle, Romans says, between doing his will and doing God's will. How many of you know God's will is going to change things around you and change your life? How many of you know your will is going to give you the same of what you've already had, just more of it? Still listening to me? Amen. Now, each one of us has to discover the path of life, not choose it for ourselves. Our gifts are to be used for others and they aren't just for ourselves. So God gave you gifts, you've got to use them for others. Some of you are selfish. Self-absorbed, I preached a while back. And you got to release that and break that so that what you do, you can do for others. 
Don't use your talents in the world. Use them to secure, uh, serve the body of Christ. Don't just use what you have out there. Somebody says, well, I'm this and I'm that. That's my profession. Well, don't just use it out there. Use it for God. Use it in the kingdom. When I got saved again, I didn't know what to do, but I, I had a lot of tools and things, and there wasn't anything I couldn't build. So I went right up to the pastor after uh, a, a church service and said, uh, I get off of work about 3.30 because I go to work real early and I come right by here. Could I stop here and, and uh, spend a couple of hours and fix some things? Did you have something you need fixed? He said, do you know how to do anything? I said, sure I do. So he said, okay, here, there's some cabinets that need to be hung in the kitchen. Uh, they're sitting on the floor in boxes. Uh, uh, could you come after uh, church? I mean, after work? And yeah, sure. No problem. So I went in there and got somebody to help me and got the cabinets up there, screwed them in. And next thing you know, fixed the door. Next thing you know, I was fixing a toilet. Next thing you know, I was fixing this and that and this and that. Next thing you know, I was putting a little roof on that got tore off and I was fixing things and fixing things. And I found that those were things I could do. I didn't know the Bible. I didn't know how to preach. I didn't know that I had a gift of talking. <laughs> and so all I did was I took what I had and offered it to the Lord. Are you listening to me? And I found that I was always in the right place at the right time. Because the will of God will always be the center of where God is. When you're out of the will of God, you'll always be where you want to be and never where he is. You are a steward over the gifts of God that he has given you. A steward is a manager, not an owner. You, so use your gifts to benefit the owner who is God. Come on. And one of the things that, we must, must, that must, hap, must happen to us is to be real servants of the Lord. We must die to our self-interest on a regular basis. How many of you know, saints, the will of God will bring you to the center of where God is? Your will will put you in fleshly things, but you'll always... Should have been. Somebody will come and say, well, you should have been at the prayer meeting. Or you should have been. Or you should have. Or you should have. Or you should have. How many of you know when God showed up here in 1997 and there was an outpouring of God in this room, I am so glad I was here. I wouldn't have wanted to miss it. You see, the will of God, I know so many times when I was early on, I was just using my tools. That's all I had. I'd be in there somewhere working, and the next thing you know, uh, my pastor would show up. And uh, his name was John Jimenez, and he would show up, and I'd be there messing with stuff, fixing things. And he, hadn't, he didn't have a clue what a screwdriver and a hammer were. And he'd come in and go, you know what you're doing? And I would go, sure, hold this. And he'd be standing there, and next thing you know, I'd be talking to this guy. Well, he called me Bert for the first year. He didn't even know my name. He'd say, Bert, and I'd just answer him. I said, what the heck? I'm not going to try to convince this guy. So I just said, sure. If he called me uh, Ernie, I'd have answered that. You know, Bert and Ernie. Anyway, I, it, it didn't matter. I, I didn't care what he called me. I just cared that he was talking to me. And, and then one day he says, uh, hey, uh, I need to go somewhere. You want to drive? I said, sure. So I, I said, I'm not in you know, my clothes or not. No, I'll get in. You drive. And he gave me the keys. And I said, drive. Where are we going? Oh, I got to go. No, I took him around. He's talking. Okay. Next thing you know, drive back to church. Thanks a lot for driving. Okay. And I go back to work. And then, you know, I kept doing this. Next thing you know, uh, some ladies came over and they were what they called intercessors. And there was this little woman named Eloise. She would come over. And whenever she came over, your hair on your head stood up. And you felt like, something. oh, man, what's this, this woman? And she would come in, she, little short little thing. She'd come in and she'd say, uh, hi, how are you? And I'd go, I'm fine, I'm building this. And she'd go, I would just came because I was over here and the Lord spoke to me to find you, to pray for you. Okay, and I'd have my hand full of tools and stuff, and I'd do this, and she'd lay her hands on me, and she'd start praying, and whoo, man, saying that I felt good with that, man, and she'd pray some more, and so, you know, next thing you know, after a little while, I kept kind of looking out the door, you know, and I'd be working, thinking maybe she's coming, 
And next thing you know, she'd be in there. She'd be praying for me. And then the next thing you know, somebody come in one day and said, uh, you know, the Lord showed me that you've been faithful to the Lord and I want to give you this check and here's a check and, and, and I want you to be blessed. Uh, and it was like $500 and geez, man, $500 is like a million. And I went, oh, wow. And they said, uh, well, no, that's just you and I and God. Just you be blessed. And I'm going, man, I'm so glad that I took my time and came to do the will of God because his presence was there. Are you listening to me today? Now come with me now. I'm going to help you. Some of you think the will of God is in the performance of your secular duty when you don't stop long enough to ask what is God's will every day. Does it include that or not? Are you living that schizophrenic Christianity where today you're serving the Lord and the next minute you're hiding in a pew somewhere or barely coming to church? Now, one of the things that this has to happen now is get rid of this or die to this self-interest thing. Look at John chapter 12. This is a real good scripture in the Message Bible. John chapter 12, verse 24 and, and, and verse uh, through verse 26 in the message Bible, it says, if any of you wants to serve me, then follow me. Then you'll be where I am. Look at this now. This is confirming through the word what I just said to you. If anyone wants to serve me, follow me. I mean, you know, if you want to serve him, you got to follow him because where he is, you want to be. And he says, then you, uh, then you'll be where I am. How many of you want to be where God is? How many of you want to be in the will of God and be where he is? Now, that may mean you may be at your job. But if you don't get yourself in the spiritual place to give God honor, to give God ear, then you might be at your job but not in the will of God. How many of you know you can be in your job and be in the will of God, and that's when you're going to find that where he is, you're going to be also. Have you hear this now? And he says, then you'll be where I am ready to serve at a moment's notice. Isn't that powerful? Ready to serve at a moment's notice. Notice how many of us are so consumed with our self-interest that really we're not ready on a moment's notice to be activated by the gifts of God for God to use us. Listen. I worked, again, heavy equipment, all that. I was building homes. I built a home for a senator down in Virginia Beach on the ocean, uh, a big 5,000-square-foot house. I mean, I, I understand the process. I'm out there working. I'm running cranes. And, man, I mean, people would come, and I'm over there witnessing. I'm sharing Christ. I'm leading people to Jesus at my job. And, 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 and everywhere I went, I was praying for people. God was present because I wanted his will, and where I wanted his will, he always was. When I don't want his will, he ain't there. When I don't want his will, in other words, I don't want him to interrupt. I don't want him to interfere. I was told by this group of guys, stop telling, talk about that Jesus stuff. Stop talking about all that Jesus stuff. Stop praying for people. My old man, I would have just quickly settled it. When they got off the floor, I'd been gone. So I said, okay, earthly people that I'm, they're my masters. I said, no problem. You got to stop going to people and you start trying to preach to people and stop praying for people. I said, no problem. So what happened was I would leave the job to go eat lunch. And I would go somewhere, find a little place to eat, little, you know, little spot somewhere, or go to a grocery store and grab some things, you know, pull it together. And every time I get to one of those places, Bob or Fred or Bill would show up and they would say things like, uh, anybody sitting here with you? Oh no, have a seat. Um, oh, hey, uh, uh, could you, um, uh, somebody told me that, that you pray a lot or you do this prayer thing, whatever it is. Yeah. Uh, could, could, um, I don't know. Um, what do you need, man? Well, I'm having problems at home. 
Could I pray with you? Here? Well, yeah, I'll pray here, but I'll put it in my prayer list. I'll be praying for, oh, would you do that? Man, I don't want to pray here. I, I'm, I'm not comfortable. Would you just pray for me? Yeah. So I go back to that restaurant. I go back to that restaurant. I didn't care if I ate or not. Who's coming? Who's coming? Because, see, his will was always where he was. And if I got where he was, his will was to touch people, to change somebody, to help somebody. I'm sitting in restaurant after restaurant after restaurant, and I'm sitting there. And all of a sudden, people come up and say, excuse me, hi, how are you? Fine, who are you? Uh, I don't know you, but I know something that you know God. My wife is sitting there one day, and a lady came up, and she said, look, I'm sorry to interrupt you, and I, uh, ma'am, please uh, forgive me, but, uh, sir, you know God, and you know about tithing. I said, well, I do, both of those. And I'm sitting there. So I began to realize that when I said, Lord, I want to do your will, his will put me right where his purpose was. Are you listening today? But when I decided to do my own will... His purpose never showed up. I led nobody to Jesus. I prayed with nobody. I did nothing for God. But when I said every morning, okay, Lord, I'm going to work construction, and I'm going to serve you, and I'm going to do your will. So put me in the right attitude. I want to fulfill your will every time. Every time God would sovereignly maneuver things for me i'm standing one day and god said to me go over there and i'm thinking lord why so i get up and i go over there and i'm standing by this this shack where all the construction workers come and i'm standing there and i'm thinking why am i standing here this is so dumb maybe i didn't hear right about the time i turned where i had been sitting a 300 foot boom of a crane broke loose, fell off the crane, and tumbled back onto the place where I was sitting. Are you listening to me today? I want to be. I want to be. I didn't say whatever your position. You make clothes, you can be in the will of God making clothes. You're a dentist or doctor, you can, make, you can be in the will of God. I don't care what you do. But it's when you do not give God an ounce of opportunity that you'll do your own will because you're selfish, self-centered, and you don't care if God shows up. You'll have nothing but yourself. You can work for a judge, and God can show up. I love this now. You reading this with me? He says, then you'll, be, then you'll be where I am, ready to serve at any moment's notice. The Father will honor and reward every, anyone who serves me. How do you want the Lord to reward you? Yeah. A seed falls to the ground and dies. If it didn't, you would never see the fruit of the seed. When you let your life die, then you become a servant. A man's life equals his will God's life is God's will God cannot live through you until your life dies God doesn't work through something that's alive in Adam he only works through something that's alive who has died and is now alive in Christ are you listening so when I'm alive in Adam my old flesh I got nothing to bear evidenced of Christ. But when I die to myself, remember Abraham is going to kill Isaac? He had to give up what was his so he could have what was God's. How many of you today say, Lord, I need to say that not my will, but thy will be done. Isn't that what Jesus prayed? Father, not my will, but, the, but see, that's not the change of your, you know, I'll do your will, meaning I'm going to go become something. That's a cop-out. That's a cheap, tinsel cop-out. Why don't you do the will of God right where you're at? Right in the spot where you're at, why don't you do the will of God? And then if God wants to elevate you, move you, enlarge your capacity, you'll get that. But if you don't do, if you're not faithful in a little, you'll never rule over much.
A man's life equals his will. God's life is his will. When you persist on pursuing your will over God's will for your life, you demonstrate nothing but selfishness. Your will for your life must die so God's will can live. How do you say, Lord, I want to know your will? Look, saints, I've never, ever said, Lord, I want to know your will and had God say, this is what my will is. I think that would freak me out, (laughs) especially in that voice. But when I pray and I say, Lord, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, then God has freedom to my life to move me, slow me down, delay something, speed up something, work something, send somebody something. Uh, One morning I got up, I had prayed, Lord, I want to do your will. No, I just want to do your will, God. Hallelujah. Summertime, I'm in this little car and I go over to the mailbox to drop off my wife's letters to her mom or somebody. And I go to the mailbox and drop them in there. And I close the door and I uh, go back, get in my car and I'm ready to drive away. And this old guy is coming right at me. Boy, I see him coming. I've said this story. I've told this story. And I said, Lord, I know this guy's coming to ask me for money. He's a beggar. Now, there's nobody in the parking lot but me. I know exactly where it was, what street, everything. I see it as clear as it is today. And the guy comes over to my car. He grabs the sides of my windows. I roll my window down. He kind of stoops down a little bit. And he says, hey, how you doing? I'm good. He starts talking to me. He's talking to me about just all kinds of things. And I'm listening, and okay, I'm going, you know, and he says, uh, hey, uh, do you have any money? By the way, do you have any quarters? Well, I had two, and it was to get a seven up each quarter. I was loading dump trucks with a big crane, and I had a quarter for each for lunch and a quarter for the afternoon, two drinks. I got it settled. It's all the money I had. So, you know, I said, no, I don't. I lied. I'm a Christian. And I lied. And he looked at me and kind of leaned back and he started telling me about the things of God. Well, that freaked me out a little bit. Then he leans back and he says, hey, you must need those quarters more than I do. And I'm going, jeez, man, get these out of quarters out of here. And he says, thank you. He says, next time, remember next time when someone asks you, remember you need to speak what the truth is. Well, shut up. Well, he walks away and he gets to the back of my car and it's just like he took a zipper and he opened up the atmosphere and he just stepped in and closed it behind him. No one's there. The whole place is empty. It's daytime, morning, and I'm watching a guy step in to some other world and zips it up and he's gone. I am freaked out. So I go to work. All day, didn't use those two quarters. I didn't even get to 7-Eleven, uh, 7-Ups. I was so blown away. I go home, I'm freaking out. I'm going to the house and the phone rings. And a lady, uh, Jean Jernigan, Phyllis. Phyllis calls and Corley says, uh, it's Phyllis. Phyllis and a lady we just barely met, knew. I, oh, okay, I grabbed the phone. Hi, hi, Phyllis. Uh, Bart, don't say anything. Oh, I was in prayer this morning and the Lord told me to call you today and tell you be careful lest you entertain angels unaware. Ha! I jumped back and said, what are you doing? Lord, I want your will. His will is where he is. How many of you want to be a little bit more clear and say, I want to be where you're at? Can you hear that? I don't care what it is. Whatever your job is, that's okay. Don't try to change jobs. Try to find his will. Wow. People are afraid because they think doing God's will won't be as fulfilling as what they want to do. So they limit God's Zoe abundant life from flowing through their yielded life. You'll never know God's will for your life, my life, until you cancel your plans for your life. 
God's will and plans will always be better than your wills and plans, no matter what it looks like. Genesis 22, 1 through 5, Abraham called what God told him to do, worship. When God told him to take Isaac and take him up on the hill, God, uh, Abraham called what God had told him to do as worship. How do you know, whatever God tells you to do is going to turn out for your good and it becomes a place of worship for you. Can you hear that? Kill my child. What do you mean kill my child? Oh, no. Do what God tells you to do and it becomes a form of worship. I'm not saying go out and kill your child. Some of you probably have wanted to, but don't. How many of you know worship becomes the point of your sacrifice? Deuteronomy 10, 12. God requires us to serve him with all our hearts and minds and with our entire being. Serving God requires a change in your attitude. How many of you say, Lord, I need to change my attitude? Serving God requires a reverence and the fear of the Lord. Hebrews chapter 12, 28. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Psalm 2, verse 11 in the Amplified. We need to serve the Lord with other, for, uh, for, and others, serve the Lord and others with joy. Right attitude and clean motives are a requirement to be in the be a true servant of the Lord. How many of you say, Lord, I need to be a servant? How many of you hear that? This church has been built on people wanting to serve. That's how we got to this stage. All the things we've done over the years is because people were willing to serve. We're going to have to have some people willing to serve for Can Can. We start bringing in food. We start setting up contacts. We're going to need somebody to step up and say, I'll be the servant I'll serve, I'll be in the will of God, and I'll serve others. How do you hear that? Hmm. Philippians chapter 2, Paul said something. He's sending Timothy to these people in chapter 2, verse 19. Look at it in the Amplified. Philippians chapter 2, verse 19. Look at it. But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly. Um, okay. We stopped. 219, but I hope and trust the Lord Jesus soon to send Timothy to you so that I may also be encouraged and cheered by learning the news of you. Please go on. For I have no one like him, no one so kindred a spirit who will be so genuinely interested in your welfare and devoted to your interest. For the others all seek to advance their own interests. Not those of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. I mean, you know, Paul's talking about Timothy. He said, he said this kid wants to do the, the will of God. He said, these other folks that are around, he said, all they want to do is serve themselves. For the others all seek to advance their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. Come on, go to verse 22. But Timothy's tested, wor uh, Timothy's tested worth, you know. How as a son with his father, he has toiled with me zealously in serving and helping to advance the good news, which is the gospel. How do you hear that? Paul's talking about this thing, and he said, Timothy had the right attitude. He had the right approach. He wanted to serve. Now, we are true servants of God. If we are, we will use whatever we have to serve God. How many believe that? How I mean, you know if you're really a servant of the Lord, I didn't have a single talent, not one single thing that I could say I could do. Now, I could build things. I could take cars apart and motors apart and things like that. I could build houses. I could do things like that. I could do natural things like that. I could run heavy equipment, no problem. But I didn't have any specialty talent. But you see, God takes the little things to confound the wise. He takes what we offer him and turns it into much. How many of you know that many of you college degrees, many of you have great, great capabilities? And you have to ask yourself in 2015, what do I do with what God's given me? Am I doing what God gave me to do? Or am I just satisfying myself in my self-interest? The church will never, ever be effective 
until God's people learn the power of being in the center of his will and serving others before we serve self. How do you hear that? The minute you decide, I'm going to serve God, I'm going to serve the Lord, I'm going to serve in some way, and I'm going to be in the center of his will, you'll find he starts showing up. He starts showing up in your life. Mark chapter 10 is the closing part here. Mark chapter 10. It's a story, a real quick story that I think would help us. Mark chapter 10, verse 21. It's, a, it's an amazing little story here. And Jesus is talking um, to um, his disciples. And then all of a sudden, a young man comes up. Mark chapter 10. And when that young man comes up, <laughs> he has to speak to him. And now as he was going on, verse 17, out of the road, one came running, knelt down before him. And this kid had zeal, boy. He was running after him. Good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? So Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but one. That is God. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. He was addressing that because the guy had come under a religious spirit. You know the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and your mother. And he answered and said to him, teacher, all these things have I kept all from my youth. And Jesus looking at him, loved him. Now that's the important part. Jesus looked at him and loved him. Now that love would melt you. And he said to him, one thing, oh my God. Can you imagine the Son of God looking at you with those eyes and saying, just one thing. One thing you lack. Go your way, sell whatever you have, and give to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. And come and take up your cross, take up the cross, and follow me. But he was sad at his word. He went away sorrowful. For he had great possessions. How do you see that? Remember, we're stewards, not owners. How many of you know this young man was told to do one thing? One thing. One thing he was told. All you need to do is one thing. How many of you know in our Christian life, we ever get to the place where we're narrowing it down that all we had to get rid of. How many of you could get rid of one thing? Just, just one thing, Ashton. Is there just one thing you could dump aside? Yeah, right. How many of you could get rid of one thing? So if Jesus came to you and said, get rid of this one thing, you would say, sure. Your pride. Get rid of that. Well, yeah, but Oh, what about that unforgiveness? No, we don't need to go there. Let's go over here. Why don't you give that part of your money? Oh, no, 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 no. That's separated for me uh, to have this and that and do this. I'd be actually, I'd be actually worried. If I was praying and the Lord showed up and said to me, one thing, that would bother me because I know that whatever that was, I'd want to pick the thing he was really after. Huh? And he says to him, go and sell everything you have, give it to the poor and come follow me. And he says the young man went away sad. How can I do that? Do you know, saints, I say this, and I've said it many times. Our human will is more powerful than any demon who's ever been on the earth. Because your will can say no to God. But demons can't. The 
The Bible says in, in, in John, it says the demons knew who he was. The demons, it says, they trembled and knew who he was. But you and I, because we have this thing that God in his sovereign way gave us, it's called my will. So I have the will to say, God, later, I'm going to do my own thing. Uh, God, uh, call me back in a couple of years after I've had fun. God, check back with me in a few years after I've done this, 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 and this. How many say, Lord, I want to do your will? How many you want to serve the Lord today? How many you want to serve the Lord with all your heart? Will you stand on your feet? I'm going to pray for you. How many you want to serve the Lord? Let me see your hands. Anybody in here? How many you want to serve the Lord with all your heart, with all your might? We have a wonderful opportunity. We're going to go dedicate that building this afternoon, but we have a wonderful opportunity. We have a brand new facility that we can serve and uh, find food and give food and touch people. I believe one of the most common practices of decency and caring on the earth is that we would care enough about people to give them a meal. That we'd care enough about people to help them with food. We might not be able to meet everybody's need and do everything, but I think we could at least help people have a bite to eat. How many, how many understand that? Jesus said, I was hungry. You didn't feed me. I don't want to be there. I want to be able to. We've been here 31 years. Since the day we came, we've been doing can can Make a Difference. We've been helping putting food out, helping people, feeding. It's into the millions that we've helped. We were able to take those numbers and really look at them objectively, and it's amazing how much food. Two public schools. We fed chocolate and vanilla. We, uh, no, not two, several, I'm sorry, several. We gave them chocolate and vanilla milk for two years down at our warehouse. We supplied them with the chocolate and vanilla milk. During Hurricane Sandy, we put 15 tractor trailers. If you don't know what that is, a whole tractor trailer, 52 footer or whatever, that's a lot of stuff. We put 15 of them up in New York and helped people. At one time last year, year before last, we were feeding 20, 23,000 people a month. We ended up moving about two and a half to three million pounds of food that year. How you know that's amazing? How do you believe that's an amazing feat? How many of you know, saints, it takes people who want to serve. I want to be around people who want to serve God, not people who always want to be served, always want, always want to take always want somebody to make sure they're blessed. Would you put your hands out and say, Lord, I offer my hands to you today. I want to know your will. Even at my job, even at the place I'm standing today, I want to know what's your will. And in my ignorance, help me see it when I don't usually see it. Help me be aware of your plan because of my prayer every day. You'll put me in the center of your will. In Jesus' name. Now let me help you. Let me help you. The center of his will will never, ever be centered around your good pleasure. When I said the center of his will, God only shows up to do what he wants done. 
So when you look at that prayer again and you say, I want to be in the center of your will. Oh, it was his will today that I got so blessed, added to, multiplied and all. That's sometimes part of it. But let me help you. If you remove those scriptures that I just preached, if you take them away, you'll realize that your will is not ever going to bring anybody into the kingdom. His will will. He puts people in your path. He puts people in front of you. If I asked you the question today, when was the last time you led somebody to Christ? When was the last time you had somebody's hands and you led them to Christ? When Jesus came to give his life a ransom that many might be brought into the kingdom. 2015, something new's got to happen. Some of you that never win a soul, you need to repent because you're mostly selfish and you're not looking to your left or your right. And God is sending people your pathway. My wife and I were on vacation last year and the Lord put us in a little restaurant that was nobody there but us. And they eat chicken and stew for breakfast never seen anything like it so soup bowl of chicken it fell off the bone with onions and meat I mean onions and potatoes and all but that was breakfast you know what that is okay she's over here yay amen maybe I'm making her hungry I don't know but in the process my wife and I began to talk to this lady she finally brought a chair She's the owner. And she began to tell us how her life had been really not going well. And she had been saying, Lord, I need somebody to talk to me, encourage me. And here we were on vacation, of course. I'm vacationing. I can't talk about Jesus. Let me say, Lord, make me aware. Your will always be where you're at father in Jesus name I pray right now let there be a settling of holy conviction over the hearts of your people that we will not be satisfied with our life of normalcy and selfishness but that Lord 2015 will be the birthing of something alive and fresh and exciting that we get outside of our box that we get outside of our, our, our selfish, self-centeredness and we embrace God, the center of your will. And we'll see a harvest come in. We'll see lives changed. We'll see sovereign appointments uh, and anointed moments, Lord, uh, that you'll intervene and cause us to be a rejoicing people that every day becomes an exciting day to find you in the midst of our lives. Father, I pray all over this room, I pray for those that are just absolutely cold. You know who you are. I can prophesy to you. You're cold. Your heart is hard. Hard. Your heart is hard. And I just pray that God, like a, like a spring wind, gentle breeze would just blow over your heart and soften you. Soften you. Father, in the name of Jesus, soften your hearts of your people, God. That will not get so cold and so hard that will fulfill what Timothy said in the last days men's hearts will grow cold the lack of the love of God forgive us Lord forgive us we thank you Lord we thank you in Jesus name Lord I pray right now all over this room heads are still bowed maybe somebody is here today and doesn't know you 
that's you right now, you say, Lord, I need to give my life to you. I need to surrender to you. I need to be your servant. I need to let go and let you come in my life. If that's you right where you stand, I want to pray with you. Just hold your hand up. Say, Pastor, it's me. I need today to get my life right with God. I need to give myself back to God or I need to get right with God. Hold your hand up so I can see it. And I'll pray. If that's you, yes. Yes. Anybody else? Hold it up. I don't want to miss you. Just hold it up. Say, it's me, Pastor. Pray with me. Just say, it's me. It's me. That's all I need you to do. I'll pray for you. Anybody else? You raised your hand? Yes, over here. You raised your hand? Come down so I can pray with you. Come on. You slipped your hand up. Come and stand here right now. Come on, sweetie. We'll pray. Anybody else? Anybody else? Come on. Anybody else? Come on. Anybody else? Quickly. If you raised your hand now, I don't want to drag you. I don't want to beg you. Okay. Pray right there and that's it. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for that prayer. And Lord, I bless your people. I thank you for this day. In Jesus' name. How many of you hear this? How many of you hear this message today? Come on, let me hear you. See your hands. How many of you hear this today? How many of you say, Lord, I want to serve your will in 2015? Can you say amen to that? How many of you would like to do something today? How many of you would like to do something? We're getting ready to go in and dedicate our new building. How many of you would like to sow something and bless that ministry? I'd like you to do this with me. Would you pray with me? I'm going to ask you, guys, put some plates up here. I'm going to ask you to think about and, and, and pray. We're, we're believing for a forklift right now. We think we might have one lined up. We're talking to some people. We want to do the will of God, and we want to feed. How many of you believe that that warehouse is going to touch a lot of people? And coming up on this hill is also, there's a motive behind it. Maybe we'll have them close enough to the church. We can bring them into the kingdom. Come on. How many of you believe that God wants to bless that ministry? We need about seven, dollars $8,000 to buy a forklift. Uh, if that's you, you can say, amen, I'll buy that. I don't know who's here today, so I never know. But we need you to give generously. Do not tip God. Let's sow something today. I have a figure in my heart that I'd like to see us do today. Listen to me and I'll tell you. It's 2015. We're all finished with Christmas. And we all didn't get in debt this Christmas. Now, I'd like to see us put $10,000 in the plate and say that's a good startup contribution for, for CanCan to be able to launch out and be able to do what it has to do. I, I mean, believe that we need to do that. Eventually, we've got to hire somebody. So we need somebody to run the place. How many of you believe that God will use this ministry to touch him? Anybody here today? Some of you act like you're half asleep. Let me believe that God will use this opportunity. The Bible says if you're a friend of the poor, then you've become a friend of God. So would you pray with me right now? Maybe the Lord wants you to put a thousand in. I don't know. Maybe the Lord wants you to buy that forklift. Seven, eight thousand. I don't know. Isn't that what it costs, Mike? Okay, seven, eight thousand dollars. Somebody might want to. I don't know what it is, but I want you to sow. In the, we're going to dedicate this building to the Lord and then walk away and it's poor. I you know that building should not, never reflect poorness. Though we give away food, it should represent the kingdom of God and the abundance of blessing. How do you hear that? It should not ever. That's why when you drive up, you're going to see a nice big sign on that building. And it's going to give glory to God because we believe that the Lord wants us to bless people, but not out of a spirit of poverty, but out of a spirit of blessing. Now let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, I pray for your people right now, all over this room. There's some that will give a hundred, some that will give five, some that will give a thousand, some that can give more. Lord, speak to your people today. I ask everyone, leaders, everybody in this room, sow something into CanCan. Sow something into CanCan, make a difference. Let's launch this ministry with joy that we say, amen, CanCan's not broke. Isn't it wonderful? It's paid for. Now we get to launch it into actual operation. So Father, speak to your people today and lay this on their heart that this is a good thing to do. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Now here's what I want you to do. I want you to stop. Do not give a tip. 
I'm asking you to sow into a ministry like this was Billy Graham Association. You're sowing into a ministry, a seed that will make that work down there flourish. How many hear this? Come on. How many of you hear me today? Now we're going to go down to the end of the street here and we're going to dedicate that building. We're going to be down there in 15 minutes. So between now and 15 minutes, we're going to be in there. If you want to come, come join us. But before you leave, please bring that gift to the Lord. I want this ministry to be a blessed ministry. Can I hear something from you today? Rock Church, would you act like you're saved? How many of you believe this ministry of Can Can is of the Lord? Well, how many of you want to hear an amen and a shout that this is going to be something fruitful? Could you, could you respond? It's like some of you act like somebody put a gun at you and, and I'm not trying to rob nothing. I'm trying to sow something. Please be generous with the Lord. Get in His will and you always will. His will, you always will. Come on. I give myself to you.